Dr. Shahzad Nuravi is an organizational psychologist and principal of Strategy Meets Performance, a leadership consulting firm that partners with leaders of mid-sized to Fortune 500 organizations to help them create engaging, innovative and productive cultures. As an organizational psychologist and coach who's been working with clients for 20 years, she's created a guide that empowers leaders to drive strong workplace cultures. Shahzad is a speaker on many leadership topics, including emotional intelligence, resilience, diversity, equity and inclusion, change management and how to be the change you want to see in the world. Welcome to our show. I'll fire Reno, ahead. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'll fire ahead with a first question on what, in your opinion, defines a healthy company culture? Great. Thank you, Reno, and a pleasure to be here. A healthy company culture has many elements to it that are focused on creating an environment where people are excited to give their best, to give their all. They have an ownership mentality. They feel like this is my company. And when they see that something is going wrong, they are the first ones, the engaged uh, staff members are the first ones to come up to you and share with you their concerns. They are the ones that are going out of their way to make sure others are really working hard toward the goal. And a strong culture happens when the senior team of the organization is aligned together on who they want to be, where they want to go, and how they want to go there. There's a clear vision and mission. There are values that are not just on the walls or on the conference rooms, which look really nice, but they are truly values that are lived and decisions are made to those values. And there's environments where employees are onboarded properly. They have the tools they need to do a great job. Everything is measured and there's continuous improvement. And in these environments, employees are more engaged. They're more likely to stay. Research shows people can get paid a third more. But if they love their company and their culture and the values, they are less likely to make that leap for God knows what might be on the other side. So there are so many benefits that impact the bottom line when you work on your culture. So how does a company get to that level of uh, um, high uh, culture elevation? Because uh, the reality is, of course, often that uh, the values put out there in the public space don't fit with the actual reality on the ground and then you have high absenteeism low motivation right. and all that we know of companies in dysfunction that's exactly right what you are sharing is um it's like if you think of an iceberg what you see on the top that's how we that's who we say we are and how we say we get things done but if you've ever explored what icebergs look like, they go very, very deep underneath the water. And that's how things are really done. So on the top of the iceberg, you may see a beautiful website, beautiful values, messages from the leaders. And you think this must be an amazing company, but really the way decisions are made, the way people are empowered or not empowered, how people are brought onto the company, how they are exited, from the company if they are exited what's being rewarded these are all ways that shape culture and i call it culture setting when in a crisis or in a difficult time a leader makes a bold move i'll give you an example a client of mine recently had a high performing leader who he has coached multiple times to be more engaging with his team, to coach them more, to be kind. That is basic, but he wasn't being kind. And at one point he saw some terrible behavior publicly from this leader to another employee. And he made the very tough decision to not just call that behavior out, but to let that 
leader go. And that is a leader that was bringing in very high revenue clients and serving them well. Oftentimes these folks are great with clients. And what he did, even though it will cause him a bit of a pain for the next month or two because he has to recruit someone else or coach someone else up, what he did is what I call culture setting. That showed everyone who that organization is and who it wants to be. So it, there are moments where your leadership can really elevate, where you make a big leap that teaches people, this is a safe place. This is a good place. We support you. So it all starts with uh, how leaders behave at the top and what anchors they set in, in company mm -hmm. culture. And in fact, how they live that culture themselves. That's exactly right. And I love the uh, phrase anchor, the term anchor. Yes. Now, uh, it seems that there, there, there is a shift at the moment uh, where companies are more and more speaking out on social political environmental issues and positioning themselves on making a change in the world uh, how much do you see this happening i agree reno and i've been seeing it happening more and more especially in the last couple of years where people after, leaders after what happened to george floyd took a stand shared that we don't believe in this we believe in diversity, equity, and inclusion. I've seen many companies hire a professional who focuses on just that in organizations. And so when an organization decides to stand up for a belief, for a value, something that has happened in the world that they don't believe in, they're putting a, a stake in the sand. They are saying, this is who we are. And guess what? When we are so authentic in that manner, we will draw people to us. Those companies will draw people with values that mirror theirs. It will also repel some employees and potentially some customers. But guess what? Being bold like this and taking a stand is a way of culture setting. It's a way of saying this is who we are and we don't apologize for it. Yeah, it's, I, I certainly feel a wonderful uh, development as we face those enormous uh, challenges globally where um, uh, business can certainly take a leadership role uh, with politics uh, constrained in many respects, where, where businesses uh, draw people with entrepreneurial spirit, with innovation, and uh, who can make uh, decisions uh, very quickly and fast. Uh, so, um, on the one hand, maybe close cooperation with politics, but politics often is, is very short lived. Right. Well, when there is a policy that's being made and the leaders of the company believe this violates human rights and women's rights are human's rights, children's rights are human's rights. And if they believe it violates it and they have an opportunity to support their employees, then that is you're walking alongside your team and you're showing there's not just a work self and a home self. We are whole. And so companies that do that are showing their belief in that, that they support their employees holistically. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, let's go into your uh, your book, uh, which you described early on before uh, we um, started our interview. You have this three-level strategy. Yes. So my book is entitled A Powerful Culture Starts With You. And this mirrors my philosophy of life, whether it's in our home, our jobs, our community. Oftentimes we will say, I wish that street would be safer. I wish these three teams would collaborate better. I wish I had a better relationship with my sibling. And one of the things in my 20 years of coaching and working with clients that I found myself saying frequently and to myself is it starts with you. 
right? So when we find that we are dissatisfied with something, oftentimes we sit back and we wait for others to take action. And what we can do is find the power within and know it starts with us. And so after working with clients for years and giving talks to leadership groups, the question I was asked multiple times was, you know, I, I get what a good culture is, but tell me what to do. And it was such a good ask. And I designed my three model approach in a way that is practical. There are steps. I, I love when there are steps to things and it's not vague and broad. I love when at the end of a book, there's summaries, there's reflection questions, start this, stop that. So that's what I did with this book. And my first part of the model is watch it. And they're all acronyms because I think it's memorable. Watch it is a way of looking at your culture with a fresh set of eyes. And one of the big things is how do we go in open and not defensive? It's human nature to feel a little bit defensive. And I talk about how to get out of that, how to get out of one's own way. And I have four different checklists and everything that I talk about could be downloaded on a powerfulculture.com. And I have four checklists on ways to look at your culture from the communication to the group dynamics, to onboarding, to communication. The second model is drive it. It's a coaching model. And I wanted to provide something where um, leaders could have steps to drive a coaching conversation because too often we tell people what to do and why not help them think through it and then you're teaching people to fish and the drive it model I'll just walk through a couple of the steps and again this could be downloaded on a powerfulculture.com and it's one the first step determine the challenge so you are asking the person what's on your mind how are things how would you like them to be if you had a magic wand, what would you make happen for this situation? So sometimes we know exactly what's bothering us and sometimes we don't quite know. And so it's bringing it to the surface. The second step, reflect on what making this change would mean to me, is an opportunity, Reno, to dream, to think you've resolved it. What's happening in your life? What is a perfect day looking like? And um, invite a new way of thinking is about looking at this and asking yourself, what stories have I been telling myself about this? What if I were to assume positive intent? Because we often don't. Um, what might I need to quit doing? What am I doing that I just need to stop? The next one, valiantly get out of your comfort zone, is if you haven't made a step toward this goal, it's something about it that's uncomfortable. And when we want to stretch, there is a little discomfort because we are creating new grooves in our brain. Where, and instead of going the same well-worn grooves where something happens and we respond, we're creating new ways. And it's sometimes uncomfortable and it should be, and that's okay. Engage support is the next step. There are people waiting to help you and continue helping them. Initiate the first step is what's one tiny little action you could take because that creates momentum. Don't think of the whole mountain. What do you need to get to that first level? And then the last thing is transform your thinking to prepare for challenges. And this is about realizing this will be hard, but guess what? If it were easy, everyone would be doing it. You would have done it before. So it gives you some roots and groundedness that this is going to be a process and that's okay. So that's the drive it model. And the last model is a senior team alignment model called walk it. So I'm going to pause there. Okay. Uh, now we spend most of our lives or most of us uh, at the workplace. Uh, and uh, often there's this attitude of uh, let, let the company do this for me instead of turning it, turning it around, uh, giving employees the bricks to build the house, giving them the space to be creative, because we know from uh, job burnout resource, uh, research that uh, when employees feel constrained, uh, when they are forced into a certain niche, that uh, that uh, is one major factor of, of job burnout. Do you agree with that assessment? So when 
you give mixed messages to employees, that is extremely stressful. So if you say, hey, everyone, I need you to innovate. And then you ask them to share ideas and systematically one by one in different ways, you shoot down those ideas or you tell someone to take a risk and they know if they do, that if it doesn't go well, they don't have your support. You are saying one thing and reinforcing another. And that definitely, Reno, leads to job burnout. I have a high level executive in a large organization who reports to the CEO and he's being asked to take some risks. And, and he is someone who loves his job, who has no problem working 11, 12 hours a day, who's very committed. And he said, I have knots in my stomach because if this doesn't go the way the CEO wants, there is going to be a lot of problems. And all the executive team feels the same way. The head of HR feels the same way. And so this person who is brilliant and doing a great job, along with the other executives, are constantly on edge. And they may get to a point where they ask themselves, is this worth it? So certainly there are behaviors that lead to burnout. And um, there are things a leader who is open can do about it. So how do you get uh, a CEO like that to change? To realize, look, I've got to change my organization. I've got to change my way of thinking. So there are two reasons people will get out of their comfort zone and become open. One is a vision for something greater and bigger and knowing it takes work to get there. And two is pain. So the pain of high level executives who have so much institutional knowledge and have their hearts and minds in the organization, if they leave, there's going to be a lot of pain and disruption and bringing on new people who may or may not work well. And so a leader has to be in one of these two or both of these places. I cannot work with someone who doesn't, is, doesn't have curiosity or openness. And so that is the first thing I always ask. I, I understand if the person isn't ready to make changes at this moment, sure, because they need to see the data, they need to get the feedback, they need to understand themselves better. They, they need to see the risks. And so as long as the person has an opening to that, then things will work out. But if the person says, nope, it's them, it's the industry, it's the economy and, and sees everything externally, then that person is not ready to do the work. So you have to be ready to do the work. Yes, uh, often uh, I find the most successful uh, CEOs are those who've been uh, at that low point, who've gone through bankruptcy, who've okay. who've gone through, uh, walked through the hot coals, and realized, look, this is not the way uh, things are done. We got to change. I've got to change. Um, I've got to change my way of thinking. Exactly, and and it can also be forecasting and seeing the writing on the wall and asking people for feedback and saying, even if you want to give it anonymously. What can we start or stop doing? And, and it's just giving some attention to that, knowing you can have a lot more pain later on if you don't take some smaller preventive measures today. And if you look at, quite frankly, at all the most successful business leaders, politicians, uh, these are people who did um, uh, uh, coaching, did work on themselves, uh, read books, informed themselves, uh, saw the writing on the wall, as you said, uh, uh, saw developments ahead. Uh, often we have highly successful business people who then rest on their laurels and don't uh, work on themselves. Uh, they know it all, uh, in quotes. Here's the thing, you can keep a moderate level of success for many years. If you have ongoing customers and uh, your, your business is in a state where the technology is okay, 
But here's the thing, change happens. New technology emerges. Customers, as the generations change, want different things. So what are you doing to pay attention to what's going on out there and, and how you can serve your customers, how you can provide different products and services for them, how you can attract new ones. And so there's, especially during COVID, I saw two kinds of leaders and I was giving talks throughout. There were leaders who panicked and within the first couple of months laid people off. And there were leaders, as I've given talks to CEO groups, who said, we are not going to survive through this. We are going to thrive. And they got everyone on board. And everyone was giving their all. They rapidly shifted and were agile. And they did better during COVID than before COVID. So, so much of it is this mindset and this openness and this reaching out to your teams, saying, let us partner together. I, it's, it's the opposite of, I have all the answers. Here's what you need to do. I don't want your feedback. Exactly. Uh, so how do you reach uh, people at a time where, where the workplace uh, is undergoing massive change? Uh, many employees are working from home. Uh, and uh, there's obviously pros and cons to this. Uh, when they're in the office, you can talk to them face to face. Yeah. Uh, if they at home, uh, it's it's just a different setting. Sure. Well, what I will share with you, Reno, is what I have said years before COVID even happened. Years before we even had all of this amazing technology, is when you create some opportunities for everyone to come together in a meaningful way. They can build relationships. And from there, all of the wonderful technology we have is fantastic. When you don't bring people together and virtually and in person to build those relationships, then that technology is meaningless. They, it is very easy to create silos when you don't know your peer your cross-functional peer, or to ignore their phone calls and, and you know play the blame game. So I will say to you what I have said to clients pre-2020, whenever you can, even if you have people around the world, bring them together, give them up, have team building, share the strategy, share the vision, have uh, different groups where they're brainstorming and bringing all their collective wisdom together. And from there, you have a foundation. You are creating roots for that living organism of a tree of your culture so that people now will have an opportunity to grow together. And should it be difficult at a certain point to get people together, do it virtually where you create events and people are simply coming to these events to get to know each other. You're having small breakout groups, big groups, you're sharing things with them in advance that they could be excited about. I've seen some really funny things like chocolate tastings where they will send the employees these packages and then they have a class, right? So there are ways we can get creative. And I think that's one of the gifts that came out of these last two years. Yes, and the fantastic thing is of course that we can connect globally uh, much better now than we could yes. even two, three years ago. There are so many gifts that did come with this situation. So uh, it's ob obviously um, a, a long-term strategy to plant those seeds uh, until you get a, a, a company culture to that level. And the question is of obviously, where do you start? I mean, you see, you see the big uh, objective ahead uh, where you want to go? Uh, how do you how do you how do you, how do you kick off um, a change in culture? Sure. So when I shared the Watch It model, the steps include walking around, asking people for feedback, um, the different forms that I have, handling your ego. That's the H of Watch It. But the steps that I have for looking at your physical environment, because a lot of companies are back into the physical environment, are when you walk in there, how does the space feel? 
Who's greeting you? How are they greeting you? Are there files everywhere? Is it messy? Is it neat? Do you see people collaborating? So there's ways to look at the physical environment and, and make sense of what culture setting is happening. The group dynamics. Observe your culture in meetings by seeing who's speaking, who's not speaking. Are individual contributors encouraged to speak? Uh, is it just the extroverts and the managers and the males that are speaking? If that's what you observe, hey, that's a good observation. What can you do to create a more inclusive environment? What kind of communications are happening? What kind of messages are coming from the president or the CEO about the vision, new customers, the values, how you are living to the values? So I have very specific things that you can look at that are important for a good culture. And my checklist is, do we have this? Do we not? I don't have a, a rating system because everything ends up being in the middle. Do we have this? Do we not? And if you have a few trusted colleagues, and I call these culture guardians, so not just the executive team doing this, but get a sample of your formal and informal leaders and say, here's a few checklists. I want you to observe in the next two weeks, these different areas, and there's five of us doing it, and let's come back together and talk about it. There will be a rich discussion, and you will see themes among all five of the people on what things are going great and what possible areas there are for development. So that is an easy first step to start working on your culture. I find that just a great idea this, this idea of, of a culture guardian or culture guardians having an observant eye on, on, on situation. I mean, it starts with uh, walking into uh, an office room where you see people talking. There's a vibe going through the room and uh, you walk through another company and people are silently just uh, working in front of their computers and looking very stressed. Looking, you could physically identify you can feel the that. stress in the room you, yeah as humans we are like sponges to emotions we feel it right and if you're observing it and you're feeling that tension in the air how do you think people who are in that environment every day are feeling how is that good for the health of the organization i have had occasions when i go into an organization and just watching the way that I'm being treated as a visitor who's waiting and then seeing how the CEO behaves, it's aligned. I, I was one time sitting in the waiting room, several people asked, are you okay? Would you like anything? Would you care for some water? So nice. Then I, uh, as I walked toward the conference room, I heard the uh, sales, the phone sales um, employees, they were cursing. They were cursing and they were throwing you know the soft basketball around and i thought that's interesting there's other people who are talking to customers yikes then i met the ceo guess what he was kind he was very um much a nice host and at the same time he was cursing a lot so that culture setting shows up yeah. and and what's exciting about that is when you decide to make a change and you start walking that talk and role modeling, that will show up. People are starving to see their leaders walk the talk, to share a vision, to get them excited about their customers and the future. And it can change lives so completely. Yes. Uh, if, uh, as I said, uh, we spend most of our lives at the workplace and if we are happy at the workplace it yes. reflects again on our family life on our relationships in all areas basically a hundred percent reno and i've had leadership sessions where i have uh, worked with leaders on emotional intelligence on envisioning the life you want and guess what they took that home to their families and they talked about it with their families and so it, it just shows we are whole and there is so much room to tap into our deepest potential. I think we'll leave it at there, uh, Shaza. It was great talking to you. We, we touched on so many important points. Uh, what last message would you like to give our, our listeners? Well, my last message 
is my philosophy and the title of my book, A Powerful Culture Starts With You.